I'm John Mather. All right, and what are you an expert in? Well, I like to build telescopes, so I work for NASA. All and right. And we're working on the James Webb Space Telescope. All right, and are we alone in the universe? How would I know? All right. <laughs> so we, we have so far not discovered our neighbors yet. Uh -huh. uh, we imagine as scientists that they may be out there. Uh, we've been working for many, many years to try to guess how far away the neighbors might be. Uh, I'll give you my opinion. Go ahead. I think that uh, there are many planets out there that are a bit like Earth. Uh, the ones that are exactly like Earth in the sense of having the capability to support life like we know it, probably much more uncommon. Uh, and um, the possibility exists, certainly, that there's life out there. Uh, I think it's likely that the neighbors are quite far away. Uh, if by neighbors you mean uh, an advanced civilization having a conversation about advanced civilization. Um, if you just want to know, are there microbes out there? I think they're much more common. All right. So common microbes and te technological intelligence, not so common. How far away? I mean, outside our galaxy, for example? I'm guessing that the uh, nearest microbes might even be in the solar system. Okay. So we have a few places that we know are wet, mm -hmm. uh, such as the uh, oceans under the ice on the moons of Jupiter, um, probably under the, on the oceans under the ice on the moons of Saturn. Because uh, we've seen water coming out from those places. Mm. Uh, Mars was wet some time not so long, very long ago. Uh, and there are places that may still be wet enough underground where uh, my life might exist now. So that's my guess that there are microbes nearby that we could actually discover and measure and bring home within our lifetimes. So you think that the probability of evolving life is not a major bottleneck? That's my guess. Uh, the What's reason, based on this guess? The, so a uh, long time ago when I was a child, people thought, well, life requires an impossibly unlikely combination of random events. Uh, and I think they didn't appreciate that thermodynamics favors complexity. Uh, complexity uh, meaning uh, self-assembled devices, objects, molecules that uh, are actually favored by probability. So how could that be? Well, it would be that energy could be released when the more complicated thing is assembled. Mm -hmm. So we don't say water molecules are unlikely because how could you ever get three atoms to get together? Mm -hmm. We say that they are likely because energy is released when they are formed. And so that changes all the probability calculations. So I think that same idea would apply to larger molecules, the ones that become alive eventually. My opinion, uh, not being a biologist, is that we don't know how to calculate those probabilities. Uh, so we have to look to the evidence in the rocks. So the rocks tell us that uh, within a few hundred million years after the oceans were formed here on Earth, that there are signs of life in the fossils. So that says, well, it wasn't so very long, and so maybe it wasn't so very unlikely. Um, on the other hand, it has taken all the rest of time for us to turn up to be able to ask the question. So uh, the conclusion I draw from the one evidence that we have is uh, Life happens quickly and civilization takes a really long time. So in the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean? Well, good question. If you're looking for we that's like us in the sense of having uh, um, creatures that communicate, uh, have a voice, can build things, then I think uh, pretty far away. That's my guess, like thousands of light years. How many civilizations are within that distance? Who knows? Are we alone on Earth? Uh, are we alone on Earth? Um, that, that's the presumption. If you're good ask, question, we... good question. Well, we know there are intelligent creatures all around us, and they communicate with each other yeah. all the time, and we mostly don't know how to know what they're talking about. So um, your dog knows more about your feelings than you do. So are we alone on Earth? So not really. Not really. <laughs> We're not really alone on Earth, but uh, what we know of are all our cousins. The creatures that we know about are our cousins of ours. So sharing a common ancestry. So um, on the other hand, uh, people want to know, well, could there be space aliens here? Mm -hmm. So my opinion is no, if what you mean by carbon-based life as we are made. Right. Because um, the distances are just too great. If you try to imagine how a, travel is, a civilization could travel here from there, uh, it's immensely long and difficult trip. So I don't think that we could possibly survive the trip as humans or even as other carbon-based life. But, but people like Martin Rees have said, well, intelligent life, even if it's very, very far away, will produce spacecraft and then go all, all over the universe and colonize it, not with organic bodies, but 
with machines and spacecraft, and therefore the galaxy should be teeming with these things, and yet we haven't seen any alien spacecraft. So that's kind of like his version of the Fermi paradox. Yes, well, I concur with him that uh, I think uh, we are doing everything we can to build intelligent life in silicon. Uh, every government agency, every company that thinks their job is to uh, build advanced intelligence, uh, they're doing it. So if it's possible, uh, we're going to do it. That seems but to be my conclusion. shouldn't it have already been done by these technological civilizations that are not impossible? I think quite possibly it is being done elsewhere around another planet. But already have been done. Yes. Billions but, of years ago. Or maybe even currently. <clears throat> but you have to say, well, if there is such a civilization of advanced robotic intelligence, perhaps, well, would they want to travel? Would they invest the effort to travel over here? Why would they bother? So you could say, okay, I'm a robot and you're a robot. And uh, you say, well, John Robot, do you want to travel to the nearest mm -hmm. star and, and try to establish a colony over there of new robots? Mm -hmm. And I might say, no, I don't want to do that. That's yeah. a lonely trip. It's a long trip. Right, uh, how would I actually survive over there? But the argument, the, the problem with that argument for a solution to the Fermi's paradox is that you have to have all of these technological civilizations saying that, not just most. You have to have all of them because if only a few say, hey, I'm going to explore, then boom, they explore. Mm, well, maybe so. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, um, space is so large that I think even a robotic civilization will be very impatient. And, and uh, if you ask John Robot, do you want to go travel to that other star system and build a new civilization, I would have to make you a shopping list of all the things I would need to take with me so I could make sure it would happen. Otherwise, it's just me all by myself over there orbiting another star, and that isn't any fun anymore. You don't want to live Even off I don't want to be the one and only robot over there uh, having a, an exploration. But as all robots know, you need to live off the land when you arrive there on this Earth-like planet. I suppose, but um, the kind of, uh, ro of uh, infrastructure that I need as a robot is pretty different from uh, finding the infrastructure that uh, microbes need. So I can't live off microbes unless I'm designed for that. Right. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? Hmm, interesting thought. So what would you do with it if you knew the answer? That's one way of asking the importance. So philosophically, people would want to know, are we alone? Because we have invested a vast amount of effort in our philosophy and religions over many thousands of years to try to understand that question of how important are we? And so we like to think that we are the pinnacle of everything here on planet Earth. Uh, and um, it might change our opinion if we knew there was life elsewhere. Yes, it would, would, I guess, another revolution in humility. Yeah, that might be. So, um, well, humility and also perspective. Do you um, think humanity yeah. needs another revolution in humility and perspective? Uh, I don't know whether we need it. I think we might get it. <laughs> I think we uh, have two kinds of humility that we need. One is uh, that we need to understand that if we're going to live here very long, we have to protect the world that we live in. Uh, and uh, we are now the apex predator, and which means we are the enemy as well as the friend. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to deal with ourselves as the, as the uh, world-changing organism that we are. So I asked you, is this an important question, and what was your response? Well, there are two factors. One is the philosophical one, and, then, and one is the, uh, the humility side that says, uh, well, maybe you are alone. You, this is still your only home. So your answer is that it's an important, whether it's an important question or not, depends on what we're going to do with the answer, I think is what you yeah. said, right? Yeah. And uh, we will do one thing we might do with the answer was give us a new perspective, which yeah. often is said something positive, but... If we can also humiliate ourselves, hum if you can become too humble, we'll just be humiliated and just give up the ghost and say, hey, I don't want to live anymore. This is too humble. I'm so meaningless. I'm not going to stay around anymore. Well, I think people already sometimes come to that conclusion <laughs> when they consider the immensity of the universe. Right. And I like to remind people that maybe that's true, that uh, our place is small, and but it's the only place we have. So it is therefore extremely important to us. Most members of the public seem to think that if we discover bacteria on Mars or elsewhere, and you think that's much more likely than intelligent life, they're not interested in bacteria, they're interested in something that they can communicate with. And if they don't find that, they're still going to think we're alone. What do you say to that attitude? Well, um, 
I think that's what we will find, that there will be bacteria within the solar system, uh, and we will say, okay, life isn't so impossible, um, and we are still alone in practical terms. There's nobody out there to ask for help. And even when we get to Mars, we'll say, oh, this is an awfully hard place to live. Now, this is not a good place for humanity to claim as a second home. So it's you, going to take all the engineering we can manage to go there at all. So you just said if we discover bacteria that we will not be able to ask them for help. Yeah. Or they're, you know, they're, not, they're not a civilization that we can draw on to know how to solve our own problems. Well, aren't we using bacteria on Earth to help solve our problems? Well, yes, of course. But we mostly don't know how we're doing it. <laughs> okay. Now, the scientific study of Genesis, how we got here, the origin of the universe, the origin of the Earth, the origin of life, is that an important, I guess, prog program? I think it's important to people's perspective. Uh, I've met so many people that want to know where they came from, just their personal story, their ancestry. How did my ancestors come to this country? Uh, what did they have to do to get here? So we love the story of our own history. Uh, I think it's really important to us personally, um, even if it has no absolute importance. You could say, well, maybe I should forget all of my history and just think about tomorrow. Uh, and some people are like that. But a lot of us really want to know where did we come from. It's a lot it's, of us, but not all of us. Not all of us. So is this not something, we're not all alike. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, that's for sure. Um, uh, what part of your research is relevant to answering the question, are we alone? Well, I've certainly worked on the start, uh, start of the universe question, the history of cosmology. Where did the galaxies come from? Uh, what was the Big Bang like? And so I've worked on that. Uh, that's what we got some recognition for in the Nobel Prize. Uh, most recently, I've been working on the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a telescope intended to um, find out a lot more information about the growth of galaxies, the formation of stars, and even the histories of planets. So we think we'll be able to observe planets around other stars through the transit techniques. Um, some starlight goes through the atmosphere of a planet on its way to our telescope. Mm -hmm. So we can see if any of them show signs of being like Earth. Uh, I don't know what we'll find, but that's the next question. Uh, after that, I'm interested in, uh, can we see the planets directly? So I've been working on a new concept uh, to put up a star shade to catch a shadow of a star on a telescope here on the ground. And if you could do that, then you'd be able to say, I see the little dot over there, that's like Earth or not. Mm -hmm. And to m try to understand its chemistry and temperature and properties. And does it spin like Earth? Does it have seasons? Does it have continents? Does it have clouds and oceans? Mm -hmm. All those things you'd love to know about another planet way around another star. So that's a current idea, and it's a really difficult idea, but it might be still the best thing that we have to try. If, if I gave you a hundred billion dollars, with the caveat you have to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? I would spend it uh, piecewise. There's no one gigantic project you can say, this will answer my question. Uh, I think we will have to proceed in a series of steps, uh, do what we can today with what we have today, um, build the equipment you can imagine today, measure something you can look for today, and then uh, when you see what that answer is, then decide what you need to build next. So you can't really make a very long-term plan. You can say, um, I'm going to look for signs of life on planets here in the solar system. We can do that actually visiting and bringing home rocks and chemistry and do the analysis. Uh, we can look at planets around other stars. We can't go there to find out what's out there. Uh, if you found one that had chemistry like Earth, where you say, well, there's the same molecules in the atmosphere that we have, then you'd say, well, maybe they're like Earth in other ways, and maybe they are supporting life. Because here on Earth, we have oxygen because of plants and algae. And if you found oxygen on another planet, along with the other things that we have from life, like methane, and uh, supporting life like carbon dioxide and water, you'd say, oh, maybe that planet is a lot like Earth. Right. Um, <clears throat> you could also say, well, what if it's not like Earth? It could still be alive, and you would never know. So that's an interesting challenge. You can't prove it's not alive right. either. So would you spend any of your money on, I don't know, electron microscopes that would be looking for nano-alien spaceships that might be in this room? I don't think I'd try that because I don't have a, uh, any evidence that that's a good place to look yet. Uh, but if somebody told me a good reason why I should try that, then of course we would look. How about SETI? SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Would you invest any of your um, money in SETI uh, programs? I think I would because it's been a long shot all along. 
uh, but our technology is improving so rapidly that it may be less impossible than it was. Now, so if there's anybody out there transmitting, uh, there are ways to find it. You know, we're already building something called the Square Kilometer Array. Yeah, it's a gigantic radio telescope, and the people that are building it told me that um, it would have the ability to detect airport radars on planets around other stars. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, then you don't have to be listening for intelligent communication directed to us. You can just listen to see the chatter that's going on in their civilization. All right. Well, maybe they have radars, maybe they don't, but we should look. Now, you have a brain, and you have neurons in your brain. And those individual neurons do not, presumably, do not know that they are inside your brain. So analogously, do you think we are inside of an alien? Uh, good question. <clears throat> no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and why not? Um, I can't imagine such a thing. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't mean it isn't happening, but I can't imagine it. Okay, how about, do you think we're in a simulation? Nah. I think this is uh, good enough as it is. Well, you, but you talked about intelligent civilizations elsewhere as being a probability that you're willing to entertain, but you're not willing to entertain the idea that those intelligent civilizations can make simulations as good as what we see around us now. I would think, why would they bother? <laughs> I guess for the same reason we're bothering. But the uh, universe is already a really good simulation of itself, <laughs> so why do we need another one? You're a robot that doesn't want to explore and a <laughs> civilization that doesn't want to simulate, huh? <laughs> no, I think we don't need to because it's already here. We can ex the one that we have to explore is already brilliant. Oh, so this is good enough? Yeah. Uh, one of our astronauts uh, said, uh, when you're born, that's when you go to heaven. <laughs> I see, yeah. So if you were in the Truman Show, you wouldn't have sailed away to reach the wall and knock on it and say, hey, this is all fake. Um, well, he did that at the very end. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, but I don't think this is all very fake. I think this is uh, what, what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. Well, he did too, right? So to... Until he was shown <laughs> that it wasn't. Yes, he saw, he saw the, the, the glitches, I guess. Um, now, Arthur C. Clarke said... Um, any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indistinguishable from magic. But there's a Canadian guy who said, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indistinguishable from nature. And I guess the idea being when you get advanced, you get more sustainable and more tree-hugging and you're more, your existence is more compatible with jungles rather than cutting it all down and say, here's my technology over all this. So what do you think of that? Mm. those, those ideas? I think neither of them is very likely to be right. Okay. Um, my perspective uh, being a, based on my ninth grade biology is that uh, given time, um, every kind of possible combat will occur. Combat? Combat. I see. And so cooperation? So nature is built on combat and competition uh, and trying everything. So nature's evolutionary process has experimented with every possible combination of of the materials at hand. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're going to continue to see that. Right. Uh, our civilization will change dramatically over the rather short time. And um, mm -hmm. just that's what it does. Now, in the, have you seen the movie Contact? No, a very long time ago. Okay, anyway, in the movie, about three times the main character is asked, are we alone? And the response comes, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Now, what do you think of that comment? If we're alone, it's an awful waste of space. What that th I, think, I think that means that we're not alone. But alone is an interesting question because, as we mentioned earlier, we don't know how far away their neighbors are. Well, if there's no life on all these other Earth-like planets that seem to be popping up, does that mean that the rest of the universe is a waste of space? That's the implication, right? Yeah, well, I just don't think it's likely. It seems to me very unlikely that other planets are not alive. Right, but if they aren't, if they aren't alive, would you call, call, out, call that a waste of space? I would say that, um, that nature failed to find the path into producing life uh -huh. there. Right. So I think uh, the, there are lots of paths into life because I think it's thermodynamically favored. Mm -hmm. Um, and thermodynamically favored means more or less inevitable. Right, I understand that, but I'm so, asking you the hypothetical, if yeah. there is no life elsewhere, would that be a waste of space? Mm. Well, I, I think to label something a waste of space is to take a perspective from, from outside that we can't take. Okay, all right. And uh, what is your best guess at the kind of aliens that are out there? 
You said bacteria. I think the most uh, alien life will be bacterial uh, in size. Uh -huh. uh, there will be a few places where it's advanced to much larger uh, scale, as it took uh, four billion years for Earth to produce complex life, mm -hmm. uh, and the Cambrian explosion of the various uh, fossils that we have. Uh, so that was a long, long time to get to something that you could recognize from a distance. Mm -hmm. Uh, as as a thing with bones and uh, shells and so so forth, so I think that it's pretty likely that elsewhere uh, civilization or complex life has also taken a long time, okay. and we have no idea what it was that determines the time scale. Okay. Now let me try to ask. I want to ask your emotional side. I've been talking to your rational side, but now let me try to talk to your emotional side. If you could close your eyes, and I'll ask you, what kind of aliens would you like to find emotionally? I would like to find any aliens that are there. <laughs> Just uh, that's a rational answer. Yeah. that's not an emotional. Answer. I'm, talk to the emotional side again. Ask the emotional side again. Well, that is my emotional side. Really? <laughs> I'm a scientist. That's what I want to do. I want to find stuff that's there. You, but that, but that's you. But that's the rational scientific side. I'm trying to say, well, you know, when you dream. Like, or your, no, your emotional side. No, that is what I dream. Really? Okay. You just you just want to find out what's there. Yep. And you want to undo or suppress any emotional commitment you have to any particular scenario or any particular alien. Uh, well, I want to look wherever there is a place to look. Mm -hmm. And I think if I'm sure that I know what I'm looking for, then I'm not looking in the right place. <laughs> I think I need to look everywhere. You are the so out of the touch with your emotional <laughs> the, uh, the, but the But the history of our studies of uh, planets out there is that uh, we kept looking in the wrong place all the time. I, I agree on a rational side. Yeah. I agree completely with what you're saying, but I'm trying to get some emotion. Yeah, yeah. so that's my emotion. Okay. <laughs> that's all you're going to get out of me, Charlie. Okay, have you ever seen an alien? Well, I don't think so. Okay, have you, you don't think so. So can you relate it? That different? just means I have not recognized any thing that I've seen as being alien. Okay. Meaning have, Alien meaning from another star system okay. or another planet. Have you ever been abducted by an alien? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Have you ever been visited by aliens in your dreams? No, I haven't actually. Okay. <laughs> um, although I keep thinking if they were one, I would surely like to be invited to go home with them. <laughs> okay. So I want to find out what they're up to. How about the idea, it's like Stephen Jay Gould is talking about replaying the tape of life on Earth and he says if we do that, the life is so contingent that we would never again re, uh, evolve. Humans would not evolve or anything like humans would not evolve. Other people disagree with them. Do you have a, uh, take a stand on that issue or is that something so biological you don't want to commit? To? Well, I'm a very amateur biologist, okay. but I think he's right that, uh, that the uh, history of life is contingent. Everything is contingent and chaotic. Now, that doesn't mean it's also not in, not in I think it's in, inevitable that things will happen. And that if it's true that uh, the thermodynamics favors the evolution of more and more complex systems, then uh, something like us should turn up. Okay. And uh, what are the biggest misconceptions that you think people or students have about this question, are we alone? Uh, I suspect people imagine that it's much too easy to travel between stars and that it, they don't appreciate how far it is to go. So when Fermi asks, where are the other people, um, that's, not, that's sort of assuming that um, whatever civilization is there actually wants to make the trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why they would want to. Well, again, you have to say, I don't know why any of them would want to, because you can only solve the solution if none of them want to. It, that, then it becomes all right. So the biggest misconceptions are that the, the space is too space is much too smaller than it is. Anything else? Mm. Well, I guess it's pretty clear. All the science fiction f stories that you see are all about people. Mm. Uh, you hardly ever see a story about a radically different creature. Mm. So um, they're pretty speculative sorts of things, but we identify with the things that are like us. Yes. So almost all of those stories are. Telling the stories of people maybe with different right. skin. So we're projecting ourselves. We're projecting ourselves onto those so, other So sometimes things. when I talk to SETI people, I accuse them of looking for God. And I say, you guys are looking for advanced aliens who are omniscient, who know everything. And that sounds to me a lot like some people's description of God. Do, would you share that accusation or do you think that's inappropriate? Mm. I don't know what they're looking for, so I don't really know... Um, 
that either. Well, they're looking um, for intelligent aliens. Yeah, if, we're, if we're looking for intelligent aliens that are sending us a communication, yeah. then uh, the hard job is to guess what signal would they send so we can figure out where to look. Mm -hmm. So, so far we've been looking where you, we can, mm -hmm. more than where we think people really would be sending us a message. Mm -hmm. It's sort of unavoidable. Our technology is very primitive compared with what it will be even in 10 or 20 years. So we start with where we are, hope for the best, and see if anything happens. All right, now the students who are watching this are interested in the question, are we alone? And maybe they're thinking about becoming astrobiologists. What, do you have any advice for these budding scientists? Well, I think it's a very exciting time for that subject uh, for no, numerous reasons. One is we're investing a lot of effort in the measurements to see if there's anything out there that could be alive. Uh, and concurrently, we're starting to think about the, our own origins to really study the history of life here on Earth. And every few weeks, we get another huge surprise. Uh, this week, we learned that there's a whole other category of life forms, the, a fourth sort of kingdom of microscopic creatures that I just read about. Um, CPR, candidate phylum radiation, or yes. sometimes called DPAN, I think. So anyway, I forget the name of it, but it was a little tiny creature that... Uh, it's genetically almost unrelated to all the other things that we know of. Uh -huh. uh, Where did you the, read about this? It was, it's just in the news, uh, scientific news, uh, in ago? the last week. Really? Okay. So um, it's not related, closely related to fungi or to uh, animals or to plants or to bacteria. Mm -hmm. So something really pretty different and mm -hmm. nevertheless exists. Somebody found it in the dirt in um, Nova Scotia. Really? A graduate student found wow. it. Wow, okay. <laughs> and she said, well, I've got a friend who can do a genetic, genetic analysis on this uh -huh. stuff, and it wasn't like anything. Um, now, some people think that the universe is spatially infinite. The, the data seems to be consistent with that. Do you think that means that there are an infinite number of John Mathers in the universe saying the exact same things that you're saying now? I think not. I think the mathematicians would tell you if you asked them the right question that it's not like, likely. Um, there are different categories of infinity. Uh, I don't know how many students know that, but there's just to recite the first few, uh, there's the number of integers, which turns out to be equal to the number of integer fractions. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is a larger number called the number of real numbers. Mm -hmm. There are many more real numbers than there are integers, and you cannot make a list of the, the real numbers. Then there's a larger number than that, which is the number of functions of real numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's the third infinity that's bigger than the first two. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you say, I've got a, an infinite volume of space and time, you cannot say, therefore, there's another me. But in cosmology, we usually talk about, we throw around this word infinite. And I guess most people would, I guess, that they would use infinite in the sense of the first one that you mentioned, the, you know, one, two, three, four, five, in, countably infinite. Mm -hmm. And I guess in terms of space, I guess there must be some way of an isomorphically projecting a, countably infinite onto space. Or I guess you could say it's a real number? Yeah, well, so the space and time are four-dimensional and uh, describable by real numbers. So that's the infinity of real numbers. Um, so, so wait, does that mean, a, wait, that means they're infinitely divisible? Because real numbers are infinitely divisible, oh, but yeah. some people say there's the smallest aspect of space, for example, the Planck time. Yeah, Planck's. so we don't know about the smallest aspect of space, but at least uh, to first approximation, the number of... Uh, uh, points in space-time is is the infinity of real numbers. Wait, why is that? Why not the count, countably infinite? Yeah, because I take a Planck, uh, Planck we, time in space, Planck we, time in space, Planck time, and I divide the universe into Planck size cubes. Well, that maybe, would be maybe countable. You could, right? Maybe you could do that. Maybe that would be countable, which would be a smaller version of infinity. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, but I think that the number of, uh, of of trajectories that produce a John Mather that's more like the number of functions on uh -huh. a real manifold, and it's much larger. Than the, uh, than the number of points in the manifold. So that means that uh, the fact that I exist as one trajectory in space-time of some function does not mean that there's another one just like me so out there. You're, so you, I think what you're saying is that John Mather is a set of measure zero. I think so. And where did you read about these infinities? Because I've read about some things. Did well, you read Cantor or something? Or? Uh, I learned about them in high school. Okay. And again in college. <laughs> uh, in some math courses. Okay. And it's been on my mind ever since. Yes, and so yes. uh, um, 
So the fact that I think John Mathers are a set of measure zero means that uh, there's not another one of me way right. out there. Right. Or so no. most, many astronomers and cosmologists would say, well, of course there's another one like me because right. space is infinite. And the probability is and an epsilon, but yeah. greater than zero. Right? Yes, so, but I think that uh, multiplying zero by infinity doesn't give you the right answer if you don't know which kind of infinity you're talking right. about. I, you get the prize for bringing this up because I've asked a lot of people this question. I think a lot of mathematicians would give you the wrong answer because they have not asked this question in the right way. Well, Max Tegmark, for example, is famous for saying, oh, you just go a Googleplex uh, uh, size well, very far away and you'll see another one of you and another one of you and another one of you because he's not making this assumption that he's a set of measure zero. That's, yeah, that's my argument with him. Okay. And uh, I have not had it in person, okay. um, but I think that I would argue for my point. Well, you and I have the same view on this, so we must be right. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> All right. And so let me ask you one more time. Are we alone in the universe? That depends on what you mean by we. Okay. Uh, I think that we are not alone if what we mean is uh, there's life elsewhere or even intelligent life with conversations about intelligent life. Mm -hmm. I think there are other civilizations like that because that's not a set of measure zero. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's no place that exact, that's exactly like home. Uh, you said, oh, there's life elsewhere. You, you said there's two types of life, humanity, the intelligent life, and then there's life in general. But if you ask biologists whether viruses are alive, they'll say, half will say yes, half will say no. In other words, the word you just used, life, is not well-defined. Do you think it is well-defined? Or you're using this word as if it's well-defined. Do you feel mildly guilty by that? Um, I'm not going to worry about that particular <laughs> distinction because that's too hard for me. So if we find a life, uh, viruses, we don't find cellular life, we find viruses on Mars, are we al still alone? I think I would be delighted to find that there were viruses on Mars, and I would say, at least if there are viruses like ours, they have to live on something else. So our viruses mostly live on bacteria. They invade a bacteria and use them to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So um, if we find viruses on Mars, then it means there must be something for them to live on. So therefore, Mars is alive. Okay. Viruses would be a sign of life, even if we don't think they're alive themselves.